Hello, New Life Fellowship Church, coming to you again from the recorded recording facilities here at Texas Institute of Biblical Studies. And it's good to have you with us. We'll be in this environment until our leaders of our nation, which we honor and which we obey, have asked us please to not get into larger crowds than 10 people. And so we're doing this to cover our Sunday morning service, and so you're all welcome. I trust everybody will be able to tune in, and we'll go over the message today. And so God bless you, church. Just stay hooked. God's still God. Things are all right. It depends on how you feel about the Word of God. It depends on whether you trust God or you trust something else. Now, right now would be a good time to just make up your mind to trust God. Our leaders are doing what they can. The people of the medical community are doing their best. We pray for them. We hold them up, and we thank God for them. They are on the front line. So be sure and hold up your medical uh, providers, for they are on the front line. They're fighting for you. And you know what? If you could use your faith for you, use it for them also. Now, I was, since it, we're talking about the coronavirus, I'd like to talk today about healing and about sickness and weakness. And let me first preempt the whole thing with this very statement. Sickness and disease are the offspring of sin. Had there never been sin, there would never be disease. Sin is just this alien to the human as sickness. So the parent of all sickness is disobedience and disobeying God's word. They realize God created all of us. He created us with an inbred understanding of what's right and what's wrong. He said, I'll put my laws in their hearts and they'll know. So I don't know about you, but every time I was wrong, I knew it was wrong. It, it wasn't a matter of I didn't know. Because, and just like a song I heard the other day, when I had a choice between right and wrong, I picked wrong two out of three. Well, that was about the story of all of us. But those things that we thought were going to be, uh, you know, we got away with, we never get away with it. We pay for that sickness and disease by our conduct. Now, God does not put sickness on anybody. He doesn't deal in sickness. I will cover a couple of things in the Word of God, but remember this. The Lord lifts His Word and exalts His Word even above His name. He cannot go back on His Word because when He gave Adam the earth, and even when Adam disobeyed Him, even when Adam lost the earth into the hands of Satan down in the Garden of Eden, we find that God could not reverse what he had done. He had to get another Adam into the earth. And that second Adam, we call him Jesus Christ. God did it to redeem us from the thing we had launched on ourselves. And so I want to take you, first of all, to Exodus chapter 15. And I want to read you a statement from God. And to show you that sickness and disease is alien to God. It's alien to you. And God does not use sickness and disease to teach people. Many people who are in sickness and disease would die before they ever discovered what they were supposed to be taught. So that kind of foolishness we need to put aside exactly right now. So here in Exodus chapter 15 and in verse 26, listen to what it says. Uh, and he said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. And I want you to notice there are four ifs here. And that means that healing and sickness and disease being eradicated from you is contingent on conditions. All the blessings of God in him are yea and amen. And that's true. But all the blessings of God come with conditions too. And we'll prove that to you here. Now some people have said... <clears throat> Well, we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, and that's true. But it depends on what you do with the law of sin and death or the law of life in Christ Jesus will determine how you treat it and how you believe it will tell you and you will show you that that law is still taking effect. Because God said here, if you will diligently hearken, notice the ifs, there's four ifs here, if you will hearken, 
to the voice of the Lord thy God. Do what's right. And number two, give ear to his commandments. That's number three. Keep all his statutes. That means his rules and regulations. I will allow. Now this word here in the King James says, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. Now understand, God doesn't deal in disease. He doesn't have any. And so the word put there is rather a stumbling block to many people because they believe that God puts disease on people. But if you knew how the uh, Hebrew was cataloged here, you'd realize the word put there is a causative verb, but the passive verb in the English would be he allowed. He allowed you to do whatever you wanted to do. He allowed you to steal or lie or whatever it is that you wanted to do. He has to allow it because he gave you the authority in the earth. And so when we read this, and uh, I will put none of the diseases upon thee, be sure you understand that the Hebrew word does not, is not pa positive or causative, but it is passive. God will allow none of these diseases upon you. Praise God. Isn't that good? So it is great that God said, I'll not allow him, but you've got to realize you can. You can allow them. You can allow sickness and disease in your life because just because we read in Galatians uh, chapter 3, we'll read that in a few minutes, that we've been redeemed from the curse of the law and that redemption is true. Jesus paid for it in blood and combat. But we still have to choose because even in this passage here, we have four ifs. If you will hearken, if you will do right, if you will, will give ear, and if you'll keep my statutes. Statutes here is like the law. Well, you know, we have uh, laws that we take to, to people in court. And a statute means that was the standing proper procedure and, uh, and so forth when you come to court and they, they say, well, this statute calls for so-and-so. Well, God has statutes too, and those statutes call for a certain type of operation and ability. It is our right to violate them if we want to, but there is a penalty. And so I want to tell you that God, God's not in charge of your life. You are. Now, if he were in charge, he would have to stand and give an account for your life. Well, it's quite obvious he's not going to do that because he put you in charge. You can even tell him no. You can violate the law of salvation, and you can go to hell if you wish. God will allow it. He won't like it, but he will allow it because he has to allow you the full authority he gave Adam. So he said in Genesis 1.26, I begin there because that's the beginning. Very few Christians understand their authority, but the authority God gave to Adam was absolute. He said, let man have. We create man in our image and let them have dominion over the earth. Well, dominion means they are the, the boss. And so when Adam was given full, complete control of the planet, he was given the planet supposedly to reign under the leadership of God. And then when he violated that with Satan and allowed Satan to become the spiritual head of all the nations through his rebellion, then God had to abide by his choices. God has to abide by your choices. If you choose to be in violation of his words and so forth, then you have chosen to violate the law of healing and to uh, put yourself in a position for sickness. And I'll prove that to you as we go along. Let me read this completely here. This is God speaking to the Hebrews as they come out of Egypt. He said, let me read it from the beginning, verse 26. He said, if thou will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God, will do that which is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will allow none of these diseases upon thee which I have allowed upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. It's a strange phenomenon when the people in the body of Christ say, I know that by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, and, and Matthew 8, 17 quotes that exact same thing, and they say, I know that's what it says, but I'm not getting it. 
Well, it could be that you need to go to these four principles here and see if there are, any of them are being violated in your life because he said, if you will. So healing and freedom from sickness and disease is conditional on your activity. It is a gift, just like salvation is a gift. The Lord said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, the whosoever, that tells you it's up to you whether you wish to receive Jesus or not. If you do receive Jesus, then these promises are for you. If you do not receive Jesus, then the promise of redemption is not for you. It is a matter of your choice. So is sickness and disease the offspring of our disobedience and our sin. So divine healing is conditional. And if you'll notice those four conditions, there's an if there. Now, here in Deuteronomy 28, we have the curse. And I've, I've heard people say, well, yeah, but we're delivered from the curse. And that is true if we will make ourselves delivered. Deuteronomy 28 is what we would call the curse of the law. So let me read some of this. Now, some people have said, well, you know, that's, that's all taken care of. We don't have to, we're not under the curse. Well, that's true, we're not. But we can put ourselves under the curse by, not, by violating what God said would keep us in the blessing. Now, and you may say, well, Christians, Christians don't violate. Christians are delivered from this law. Well, do you know any sick Christians? Well, if they're sick, where did it come from? It didn't come from God. It came from what God said, if you will, if you will. Now, notice Deuteronomy 28, because it is a beginning in verse 1, and it begins with an if. Notice that. Chapter 28, verse 1 of Deuteronomy, it shall come to pass if. All the blessings of God in him are yea and amen. He gave them... But there are conditions to them based on our performance, based on our activities, based on, based on what we believe and what we receive. It shall come to pass if you will hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. The Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. These blessings shall come on thee. Notice you're not causing them. They are automatic. The blessing is automatic based on our performance. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if, if, if thou will hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And then it goes through the blessing. The blessings up through the 14th verse are all good things. And they include healing and they include prosperity. All of that's the promises here. Now, people have said, yes, but that law doesn't apply to us. Well, if the law of sickness and disease is operating in the Christian life, does this law apply on some level? I would say yes. The problem is we do not seem to know and or see or even perceive that our activities cause us to inherit or omit the blessings. Now, in verse 15... We see a reversal from verse 15 through verse 68. We have nothing but the most horrible curses. And among that is sickness and disease. Uh, Notice in verse 15, verse 15, Deuteronomy 28. But it shall come to pass if, if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And so the curses come on, the curses shall be in the city and in the field and so forth. And, and then, of course, right here in Deuteronomy 28, look at verse 58. This is what I want to point out to you. We're just talking about sickness and disease. Now, poverty and all the curse is, is here. But if we look at verse 58, it says, If thou will not observe to do... All the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. Now, you may say, well, with the words of this law, that's the old Jewish law, it passed away. Yes, in the sense of us obeying the sacrificial 
program and all of that sort of thing. Jesus is our, is our sin bearer and our sacrificial lamb. But he can't save you without your cooperation. And he can't heal you without your cooperation. And he's trying to show us here that our conduct will bring the blessing flow or the curse flow, depending on how we respond to his law. And, and I've heard this so many times. Well, we're not under the law, and that's true. But we are under the law of love. Jesus reduced all the 613 laws of the Jews and the Ten Commandments down to two simple commandments. Number one, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and might. Well, if your mind loved God, it won't be dealing in filth. If your body loves God, then you won't be using it for sin. And if your heart loves God, then, then all three, spirit, soul, and body, are lined up properly in God's economy, and the blessings will flow. The, he the healing will come. All of the prosperity you need will come to your aid. The thing that is so important to us as Christians is to realize how we respond to the Word of God allows it to work or stops it from working. It's not God. He will not withhold a blessing. He'll not withhold sickness. I mean, the, the, the healing from sickness. Realize that God has sent his word. Psalm 107.20, we quote this considerably all the time because it's very plain. Psalm 107, verse 20 says, God sent his word. God sent his word. Well, who, what was his word? St. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 of 1 John, I mean it's John chapter 1, says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so Jesus is the living Word, but the things that in this book are also the words of God. He was inspired by men of old under the power of the Holy Spirit of God to write the same story over this 1600 year period that this was compiled by many people who had not the same culture, not the same language, and, but the, the story remains and the track remains true. And so God is our healer because he chose to be, and he, he made, Jesus was, was striped with the stripes for our healing. 39 stripes, basically. I'm sure he probably suffered more than that, but at least 39. And the 39 stripes were to cover every type, disease, every disease type that the human body can experience. Now, since Jesus bore that, we don't have to bear it, but we will bear it unless we know that we don't have to and unless we change the way we conduct ourselves. And I've seen people that said, well, I don't know why God won't heal me. He couldn't stop you from being healed. There's no way. It says, the word of God tells us, he sent his word and healed us. He can't call it back. His word's been sent. His word is this, if thou shalt hearken under the voice of the Lord thy God. And do these things that where the if is involved, then these things will come on you and overtake you. It's important that, Christian, we understand that however we relate to the Word is the way the Word is going to relate to us. If we relate to the Word in the sense of salvation, being saved, we have to do use the Word and believe it and receive it, or we cannot be saved. God just doesn't go save people and say, well, I'm going to save that one and let that one go. He doesn't have that authority. All he does is save. He said, and this is the word of God, whosoever will may come. Well, whosoever will may be healed. It all depends on how you relate to the word. Now, if you don't know what the word says, you don't have any basis for faith. You don't have any way to access the things of God because you don't know what he said. You have no word to activate with your faith. So the word comes to us in a benign form. In other words, it's the living word, but you give it life with the faith that's in you. You put your faith into the word of God, and the word of God works because you have activated it with your faith. Now, the Lord said here uh, in verse uh, 59. Look what he said. The Lord will make the plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues of long continuance, sore sicknesses and of long continuance. Now, it's not that the Lord takes any joy in this, but because of the laws he put in 
motion for the human body and for the believer and because of what Adam did to us and put us under this terrible curse of the law and put us in this position where we can be denied the blessings of God based on whether we know what they are and how we access them with faith or with hope. Now, a person that is sick and hopes to get well will never receive divine healing. A person who is sick and hopes that God's going to do something will never receive it. It is only when that person declares, God sent his word and healed me. That's 2,000 years ago, and so now I'm healed today. God said so. And if I will agree with him, that word will work for me. But if I keep saying, I wonder when it's going to happen. I hope it's going to happen. And even tell people, I believe God's going to heal me. God doesn't going to do anything. It's not future, it's now. And we said this before, now faith is the only kind that you have. When it comes to healing and sickness and disease, we get frustrated with God because we pray and we try to believe, but we, we have to believe right now. When you pray, Mark eleven twenty three says, when you pray, believe that you receive these things and you shall have them. So the believing has to come before the receiving. The believing has to come before the receiving. When you believe, you lose your faith in what God said. You loose it into that word and that word will do the healing. Once we have released faith into that word, then our faith, you remember the Lord told the woman with issue of blood, woman, thy faith has made thee whole. It wasn't that she had faith in herself. She had faith in the living word, which was Jesus. And if you will exercise faith in the written word, it's the same Jesus. Only he's in heaven, seated at the right of the Father, so he can intercede for us. And we're here on the earth, but we can touch his word with our heart and our mind and our lips like she touched him with her hand. And the healing will come the same. Now, it goes on to say in verse 60, Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. And every sickness, verse 61, and every plague which is not written <clears throat> in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord is not bringing them upon you. They are assigned to you based on your activity based on what you can believe or what you refuse to believe. So Galatians, uh, I know we'll turn over there in just a moment, but Deuteronomy 28 spells out the curse of the law and the blessing of the law. It, and I've heard people say, well, we're not under that. Not in the sense of the Jews, no, but the principles remain in what Jesus taught. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and might. Love your brothers yourself. On these two principles hang all of the law and the prophets. Well, the law is here in Deuteronomy 28 describing it to tell us why things go wrong. And Jesus condensed all of those laws. As I said before, 613 laws of the Jews. We don't obey those laws. We don't need to, but the principle in those laws are found in the two that Jesus said we were to obey, and that is the love walk. Now, love doesn't mean you feel good toward people. It doesn't mean you feel good at all. Feeling is of the soul, not the spirit. Your spirit is where the issues of life are. The Word of God says, out of your spirit, out of your heart, are the issues of life. Well, one of the issues is healing the body. It comes out of your spirit. It doesn't come out of your mind. And so when you, when you speak the words of God out of your mouth, adding your faith with it, then that word will, will start that healing. It'll get it done. But any time that you're putting off your healing to the future, there's no faith in it. No faith whatsoever. You have not said, I believe I receive. You said, I hope I can receive. Hope has no power in it to heal, but faith does with the Word of God. Now, I know most everybody has heard uh, all about the laws in Deuteronomy 28 and so forth, and I agree with the teachers who tell you we're not under the law, but we're under the love law, even if we're not under the Jewish law that had to be just iterated here in Deuteronomy 28. <clears throat> Now the if, 
is always the law of God. And so in uh, we are redeemed, people say. But we're not under the law. We're redeemed, okay? Galatians 3, let's go read it right out of the book of God. Excuse me. <coughs> Galatians 3. Uh, just go to Corinthians and turn right. Galatians chapter 3. And we'll just read what God's word says. We are redeemed from the law. Glory to God. Well, people take that to mean I'm redeemed from sickness. Well, how come Christians are sick? Well, I'm redeemed from poverty. Well, how come Christians are poor? Well, I'm redeemed from the curse. Well, how come it's working? How come it's working if we're redeemed from it? Because we allow it to not using what God gave us for tools to fix it. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, Christ hath, past tense, he hath, which he has. Christ has redeemed us. Now, redeemed means to be bought back. Bought back. You were sold, and now he bought you back. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Well, Jesus hung on the tree for our punishment for all the misdeeds we were guilty of. And he absorbed all of that out of your life so you could be born again. Verse 14, Then that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now the reason that we're going to receive the Spirit is the Spirit of his Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, and place us in the kingdom of God without limits. Now, the curse of the law was broken, and thank God it, it was, and so you can really declare, I was redeemed. You were redeemed, but the if is still there. It's just like being lost, and being lost long enough that you realize I'm under the curse and the only way. And of course, Romans 10, 9 and 10, we, we quote this all the time because it's, it's the Roman road to salvation. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well, it works the same way with healing. In your heart you believe that God sent his word and healed you, and with your mouth confession is made unto salvation. You have to confess what Jesus said before you'll ever have what Jesus said. You must say it before you get it. Now remember uh, Brother Hagin, who's one of my fine teachers. He was paralyzed for 16 months, and he couldn't move his body, and he began to study his Bible and he cried out to God so many times, Oh God, heal me, heal me, heal me. And then it, it didn't happen. He kept, you know, he was frustrated with it. And then one day he looked at Mark eleven twenty three, and it said, When you pray, verse, chapter 11, verse 23, 24, he said, When you pray, believe you receive. Not when you receive, believe, but when you pray, believe. Well, what does that do? It is you siding with God against your symptoms. You side with God against the symptoms in your body. So if you'll side with God, it, the body will have to obey the word of God if you are, have all the ifs in line. If you're doing this, if you're doing that, if you're doing this, if you are doing what God said, healing belongs to you already, but you can access it with your faith but don't try to get healed from cirrhosis of the liver if you're going to continue to drink heavily. Don't believe you're going to give, be delivered from uh, anything as long as you continue. To, well, you know, you can ask people, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, now, have you ever lied? Well, yeah, I have. Have you ever taken anything that wasn't yours? Well, yeah. Well, have you ever lusted after the opposite sex? Well, yeah. Okay then here you are, a thieving, perverted liar. Don't you think you need saving? 
<laughs> now, don't take it for personal insults. I'm talking about all of us, all of us in the same boat. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But many people feel like that, you know, I wasn't all that bad. Why do I need to be saved? Because your spirit's dead to God. That's why. And you're not in the family of God until you get birthed in that family because you don't get in that family by osmosis. You know, God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children, and they have to be born to him in the new birth of the Spirit. And so it's imperative we understand that our healing is not up to God. That's been given. Our healing is up to us. Our deliverance is up to us. All our salvation is up to us. For the Lord said, whosoever will may come. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, people are perishing, yes. Are people in hell? Yes, we have a biblical record of that. Some people say, I don't believe in hell. Well, that's not going to put the fire out just because you don't believe in it. Some people will say, well, I, you know, I'm just not that evil. I mean, some people have been that evil. I haven't been that evil. That very thought's evil. You're saying, I'm equal to Jesus. Look, I am. I'm, I'm perfect like I am. Well, that's the height of audacity and, of course, foolishness. When the Lord said, all of sin comes short of the glory of the God, that put us all in the place where we're headed for the pit, and that's where we'll go unless we change that destination. And God's not responsible for changing your destination. You are. Many people never change, and so this day, if you could hear those cries from hell, you'd hear the people that say, I wish I had turned. I wish I'd changed. But there's nothing you can do about it once it's set. There is no purgatory where you can be prayed out of it. There is only this. Those who are lost, they're going to be with their father, which is Satan. That's their spirit. And those who are saved go to be with the Lord because that's their spirit. Glory to God. Now, Christians are sick. Why? Why would a Christian be sick? I thought we'd been redeemed from the curse of the law. And the curse of the law says that these sicknesses and so forth will come upon you and overtake you. So why, why is a Christian who's born again, why do they have sickness? Well, in Romans chapter 8, I want you to turn over there to chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8. And I want you to see what it says here because... Uh, the, you know, this, this chapter here has been under attack by a lot of people who said, you don't have to confess your sin anymore. It's not necessary because you start confessing your sin and you'll be sin conscious. Well, the only way out, the Lord said, if we sin, it's in the book, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. Well, an advocate is the same. We would say it's a, a lawyer. We have someone to plead our case. Jesus will plead our case for us before the throne. So if we don't violate our, our, our salvation, I don't mean we lose it. You can't lose it. It's a gift. Salvation is by grace through faith. And it's a gift of God. And so you can't lose it, but you can deny its ability to help you based on what you believe. And so here in Romans chapter 8, I've heard people say, well, this, the, the last part of verse 1 is not even in the original manuscript. It isn't some, but not all. But we read further on down in the chapter, we find it says it again and again, the Word of God says this. So when people tell you, and I've heard some, some preachers say things like, you don't have to confess your sin. Well, God said you did. I would rather listen to him. I'd rather listen to him. Am I a sinner anymore? Not my spirit. My spirit is pure before God and impossible to sin. But what about my body and mind? Well, the Lord told us, you keep your body under. Paul said, I keep my body under lest when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. That means that he's not going to be lost, but his whole life and all the promises of God are lost to him, a castaway. And also, we have to realize it is not God's purview to heal us. He's already declared in his word that's who we are. We're the healed. Well, how come we're sick? Well, I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Period. There's no period. There is a comma there. Who walk not 
after the flesh. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now here in chapter 2 are the laws that we're dealing with. You and I, Christian, this is New Testament, this is not Old Testament. Verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, that's the old Roman, I mean the old Israeli sacrificial system with animals, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now pay close attention here because these two laws are continually in conflict. Verse 5, For they which are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the, fle- the Spirit. For to be, verse 6, For to be carnally minded, that means flesh-led, flesh-led, to be flesh-led or flesh-minded is death. Well, who's he talking to? The redeemed the redeemed. How many Christians die out of time? How many die when they should not have? I don't know. God knows. And there have been times when I've heard people say, I don't know why God took them. They were a good person. They were a good person. I don't think sometimes that we really understand that the if in our life will oftentimes trip us up. When we forget the ifs of the blessings of God, they have come conditional. Salvation is the only one that's a gift. Salvation is by grace, God's favor, God's healing and his deliverance. His saving is by grace through faith, and the grace and the faith is not of you, it's of God. It's a gift of God. So when you get born again, God doesn't play footsies with your born again spirit. He doesn't say, well, if you don't do right, I'm going to pull the plug on your spirit. He cannot do that. It's a gift. He exalts his word even above his name. And so he cannot remove your salvation. He can't even make you sick. He can't make you well. He said the word would do whatever you need. If you will engage the word with your faith, it will deliver you. Glory to God. So he said this. Verse 5. They that are after the flesh, mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit. Those who follow the Spirit within. Now the Scripture tells us, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. The Spirit of God will not lead you into uh, drinking and smoking and go with the girls that do. The Spirit of God will not leave you, lead you into that. He'll lead you from that. And if you're following Him, there's traps in those things. You've got to realize the pitfall of the whole human character is the lust of their flesh. And if your flesh is put under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you won't, com- you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And not fulfilling that lust eliminates you from disease and sickness because sin is the parent of every sickness and disease, malfunction and dysfunction. And so when sickness comes, instead of crying out to God, why, why, ask yourself, Look at the four look at the four ifs we read earlier. Look at the ifs in Deuteronomy twenty eight. If you will, I will. If you do, it will. And so don't examine God, examine yourself. And when you begin to do that, I think the Spirit of God will say, Well, you missed it right here. You need to turn that around. You need to change this. You need to repent. And repent does mean to turn. It also means to acknowledge. You acknowledge your wrong. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's written to Christians, not lost people. These things are written to Christians. Now he goes on to say here in Romans chapter 8, in verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. For the Christian, to be led by the flesh is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, that mind that is oriented to obey the flesh, is enmity. Enmity is a peculiar type of hatred. It's a hostile hatred toward God. The carnal mind is hatred toward God until it's renewed by the Word of God. Your mind 
intellect, emotions, and will need to be renewed. It is against God. It's not subject to the law of God. A carnal mind is concerned with the deeds, the appetites, and the drives of the flesh, not the spirit. And so it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Verse 8, so that they which are in the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be, the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Well, you say, but I have the Spirit of Christ. Well, certainly you do if you're born again. Certainly he lives within you. He said, I and my Father will come and make our abode in you. Well, you have that Spirit, but the choices have never been removed from you. You still make your choices based on letting yourself be led of the Spirit or being led of, of your appetites of the flesh. Then it says in verse 10, and if Christ be in you, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is the anointing of God, the anointed one and his anointing in you. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Quicken means to make alive. So our body's life will depend on what we do with the anointing God's given us with our indwelling spirit and our indwelling faith. Glory to God. And it says very simply this, that his spirit, the anointing spirit, will quicken your mortal bodies. That means your spirit will provide healing, life, and deliverance for your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. So out of your spirit comes all of the, all of the issues of life. It's so, so simple. There in verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, brethren, brethren, if you live after the flesh, you'll die. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, not God, if you through the Spirit do mortify, kill off, make dead the deeds of the body, or the leadership of sin in the body, you shall live. You shall live. Glory to God. So it's very simple here. And what God is telling us is important that we see you can be a born-again Christian and not receive any of the blessings of God that are listed in this book. You can be a child of God and never receive the peace of God, never receive healing, never receive any freedom in your prosperity, never receive any of those things because you have to access them with the Word of God activated with your faith. Glory to God. So the law of sin and death is an operation now, even in the spirit community, I mean in the Christian community. It's time you realize that it is not God's will to heal or not heal. It's your will whether you receive or do not receive. It's your will whether you receive salvation or not. You choose to accept Jesus or you choose not to. It is all your choices. And so when you look at the condition of your life, <clears throat> and I've seen people that, <clears throat> I knew a man once that came to church here and he asked to be prayed for because he had been diagnosed with cancer. We pray for people. And we have results. It depends on them. But we have results. And one of the things that he said he wanted to be prayed for because he had cancer and he was going into chemotherapy in the next week. So I prayed for him. And the power of God came upon him. And uh, he went to his therapy session. And the doctor said, well, he's doing very well. He'll, this will be a cinch. He's, he's improving as we go. Well, the prayer and the power of God heals and so when we prayed, God went to work. When he received his healing, he went to work. But then after he was given the chemo, they didn't rescue him soon enough. And the chemo treatment, he died because of it. And then we, I began to ask the Lord, Lord, what happened here? What happened? What happened? What happened? Well, I found out that there were crooked dealings in his life that he would not straighten up. He wanted to be healed but he did not want to straighten up some of his practices in business and so forth. I don't know what they were. I don't remember his name. It's been years and years ago. But the fact is, you and I can kill ourselves 
with this carnality or we can deliver ourselves from sickness and disease if we will to do so. And if we'll take the ifs about healing and apply them to us and take the word of God and apply it to us, then we need to change, not God. Glory to God. Now, I want you to see something. St. John chapter 5. St. John chapter 5. Uh, it's imperative that we see, Christian, we need to grow up. If we'll just grow up, God can deal with us. But if we're going to remain babies, then God can't deal with us. Now, here's an example in the Gospels. And you may say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, is our Lord Old Testament? No. Are the principles here fully ascribed? Yes, they are. And why would, why would the story be in here if it had not a principle that applies to us in all generations? You can't separate the two testaments. Because if you're saved, you got saved under a covenant that God made with an Old Testament saint called Abraham. You're saved because God made a covenant with him, and you got under that covenant through Christ Jesus, but the covenant is with Abraham. Hallelujah. So you got into that covenant through Christ. You got into that covenant because of Jesus' sacrifice. But it was originally cut the covenant. It was with Abraham and God. We were given the benefit of it. In the New Testament it said you're all children of Abraham. Children of Abraham. Because he was the one God said he believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, when you get born again, see, you're just believing what God said. You don't get a telegram from heaven saying you're saved, your name's on the book. All you get is the word of God. It has to be sufficient. And so when you say, okay, Lord, I believe you, to you it's imputed as righteousness, and in the kingdom of God, you're as pure before God as you'll ever be spiritually but he tells you, you've got to keep your, you've got to get your body under. So find out what the word says about your body. And also, James says you've got to be reprogrammed in your mind to prove what is that good and perfect will of God. That will save your soul, not the born again. That's, that's your spirit that gets born again. The soul is the mind, intellect, emotions, and will. And so you change your soul or save it from all of the sin and degradation that you've been taught in the world and you do that with the word of God by the transforming power of the word of God in your mind glory to God okay in John chapter 5 let me read this story to you it says in verse 5 a certain man was there now Jesus was in Jerusalem a certain man was there that had an infirmity 38 years infirmity means he was sick 38 years sick. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying, knew he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, will you be made, pardon me, will you be made whole? And then the man comes up with the excuse. Now, this is uh, in a, at the sheep market pool in Bethesda, Bethesda in Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, Legend had it that if people would gather around this pool, that when the water was troubled by an angel, they would run down and get in the water, be the first one there, they'd receive healing. Well, that was a legend about this pool. No scriptural proof of it, no scripture proof that anyone ever got healed there. And even some of the local businessmen taking pity on the people who were infirm would come out there in the hot sun, wait for the water to be troubled. They built some sheds for them to sit under in the hot sun. But these people were sitting there at the side of this pool when God had made provision for their healing over at the temple. If they had gone to the temple, like God said, under Jewish law, and they had made the proper sacrifice, and the priest had prayed for them, they could have received their healing, but they ignored what God said and went to the legend of the pool. Now, the legend of the pool was when anybody got in, they were the first one to get in. When the angel somewhere troubled the waters, they would be healed. No record of not one healing that ever happened. And, of course, this man said, uh, the legend here, and you won't find this in the later text of the Bible, and especially if you want to consult the uh, Amplified Bible, you'll find this whole story in there. But he said... In verse 3 of chapter 5, In these days, 
lay a great multitude of impotent folk to blind, hauled, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stopped, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Not one record of one healing. It doesn't say that it happened. They said that it was said of this pool. Notice the reason that I know it was not worth anything is because Jesus ignored the pool. He didn't say, well, I'll help you. I'll help you get down there. And another thing. He had already made provision for people to be healed in the law of the Jews. With the proper sacrifice, with the thing that had to do with healing, he's already provided it. For in Exodus, we read a few moments ago, I'm the God that healeth thee. Well, these people weren't looking to God. They were looking at a pool. Many Christians fall in the same trap. Instead of looking at God, they look at the symptoms. Well, you know, I just, I just feel like I'm getting worse. Well, you better start looking at the remedy instead of your symptoms. And the Lord is saying, lift up your eyes. Keep my word ever before your eyes. Plant it in your heart with your confession because it's life to your flesh. It's medicine to your flesh. God's word's medicine. And so this man was saying, it is, it's so impossible for me to be healed because I can't get down there in time. Somebody goes in before me. But if you'll recall, <clears throat> Brother Hagin was talking about, and I co I'll come back to this, because he was talking about, he was, uh, I think he said, uh, 16 years old, and he was in the bed for a total of 16 months. But in that process of time, he was told by the best doctors in the country, even the Mayo Clinic and so forth, that no one with his disease had ever lived past 17. And so he was just under a death threat. And he said, I, I, would just, I would just claw the headboard of the head trying to hang on to life. And he said, then one day I saw it. When the scripture said, believe that you receive and you shall have. And he said, I see it. I've got to receive it with my faith before I will have it in my body. I've got to believe it before I can receive it. So, you know, he told the Lord at that time, he said, okay, Lord, I believe I received the paralysis limb gone from my body and my legs operational. I believe I receive what you provided and, and I'm, taking, I'm taking your word right now and I believe that I receive my healing. And then he said in a moment, the Spirit of God said, well, if you're healed, it's time you got out of bed. And so you've, you've read the description of how he plopped both feet to the floor, barely could move part of his body, and his feet were like a couple of chunks of wood. He said they hit the floor. And he said, I began to slide down, holding on to the bedpost. But he said, uh, right there, I was in a lot of pain. And, I th and the devil, of course, spoke to him. He said, now, you're going to be laying here flat on the floor, and you'll lay there for a long time before somebody finds you. And so the fear was there. Anyway, he said, no, I believe, I receive, I believe, I receive. When you're desperate, you need to do desperate things. And I don't mean... If, if God tells you to get up, it's time to get up. But what he did, he said, I sat there for a moment, and when the room quit spinning, I decided to put weight on my feet, and he said it hurt. It was a terrible hurt at first, but he said it felt so good to have feeling because I didn't have any for all those months. And then he said something that felt like warm honey just came pouring down over my head, down over my shoulders, and as it passed over my body, my body came alive. And he said, that day I got up, and I've been up ever since. And he preached the gospel until he passed on to the Lord at 87 years old. And that happened when he was 16. Now, if God can do that, he can certainly handle your problem and my problem. In my case, he has handled problems beautifully. Now, we're getting back to our story, our narrative here. Jesus said in verse 6, will you be made whole? The impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man. When the water's troubled, he was looking to a man, looking to a man to help him to fix it. To no man to trouble uh, when the water's troubled, to put me into the pool, and while I'm coming, another step is done before me. Jesus says unto him, Ignore, he didn't say ignore the pool, but Jesus ignored the pool. Be sure you do too. Be sure you ignore everything but what God said. Everything else is a trap. Everything else is a diversion. 
He said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Verse 9. Immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. And I've heard people say, well, I wish Jesus would just appear to me and tell me to get out of this bed or restore to me my health, restore to me my ability to walk or whatever. You've got the word right here. If you'll touch this word, like Jesus told this man, simply rise up and walk. Then if you look at this as it's a direct application of your problem from God's word, then it says the man was immediately made whole, took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. And the Jews, now here's the world for you. The Jews, therefore, and I said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for thee to carry that bed. In other words, we don't care if you got healed. You're violating a rule. You're violating our churchianity. You're not supposed to be healed. You're supposed to suffer for the sake of Christ. You're supposed to suffer for God. You're supposed to suffer. You're not supposed to be healed on the Sabbath day. It's against the law. Well, it wasn't against Jesus' law, was it? No, glory to God. Verse 11. He answered them, and he said, He who made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed was not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Verse 14. Here's the clincher. Listen to what this says. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus finds him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Sin is the parent of sickness. Sin brings sickness. Sin brings disease. Sin brings weakness. And so when you are having difficulty with some kind of sickness in your body, it may be not your misdeeds. It could be simply just one of those things that's going around, but you don't have to be sick if you don't want to. And the thing that I'm telling you right here is, if you do what God's Word says, then it will deliver you. And watch what you're doing. If you have an ongoing condition, check yourself out. Something is wrong because God's Word cannot fail. The one remedy for sickness in the church. And here's what I want you to see. James chapter 5. This is what I use a lot because... It's very effective. James chapter 5. This is about healing for the Christian. Well, well if we're redeemed from the, from the curse of the law, how come Christians get sick? Well, you tell me. How come? If we've been redeemed from the curse of the law and sickness and poverty and spiritual death is under the curse of the law, how come people die and go to hell? They choose. How come they get sick? Misdeeds. How come they can't get healed? No faith. Amen? Just think about this. So in James chapter 5, it tells us in the church. Now, this is not Old Testament. This is New Testament. It also tells us how to get people healed. And if you're a child of God and you belong to a church, and if, especially when we get, we're able once again under our leaders to have congregations come together, then here's what needs to be done for any of you who are sick. Verse 13 of James chapter 5. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. You can pray yourself out of that. How? I believe I receive my healing now before you ever sense it in your body. You lose your faith on what God said. You can pray your way out. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Verse 14. Is any sick among you? Well, why would a Christian be sick if we've been redeemed from the curse of the law? Well, it's very simple. Christians are sick everywhere. I mean, from time to time, Christians get sick. Amen? Now, if that's not true, then something's terribly wrong with what I think because the Bible tells me that sin and sickness is a direct, I mean, that sickness and disease is a direct result of misdeeds and sin and not complying with God's requirements. If thou wilt, hearken unto me. Keep my word ever before your eyes. All the things God is telling us, 
if people can still get sick with that in force, then there's something wrong with the Word of God. But if they get sick and the Word of God works, then the problem is with them, not God. And so when, you know, anytime I'm dealing with things in my body, and I've had to, that is, if is any sick among you, let him call the elders for the elders of the church. We're talking New Testament healing here, not Old Testament. And if these are Christians and they're children of God, and he says that the church has elders, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. If he's a Christian, why is he sick? Why is he afflicted? Because of our misdeeds. Glory to God. Fools because of their misdeeds find themselves afflicted. Glory to God. So he said here in verse 15, after the anointing of the oil, verse 15, the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. If he's committed any sins, they will be forgiven him. Now you can see that the healing and the forgiveness of sin has to go together. And had there been no sin, there would be no sickness. Now, I don't, we've got just a few moments left. I'd like to show you a personal testimony, and that's simply this, and many of you have heard this before, but I love to tell it again. Uh, back when I was flying airplanes and flying with the Civil Air Patrol, and uh, my job was to orient uh, cadets and take them on their airplane ride and orient them to that environment. And my blood pressure was too high, and so when I went to my flight surgeon, he said, we're going to have to put you on a, a medication. So I took the medication and I went home and I, I took it for a, a several, you know, probably months and months. And then finally I said, well, I'm not getting any better. I'm still having to hold the medication in order to maintain my blood pressure so I can fly airplanes. And so I began to, I began to read up the Word of God and the Word of God said, you need to speak to your mountain. Mark 11, 23, 24, speak, don't speak to God about your mountain. Speak to the mountain yourself. You have authority. And so I began to speak to this blood pressure. And I would take the little pill every morning that I took, and there's a couple other pills that were in addition to it. I think they were potassium, something like that. Anyway, I'd speak to it every morning. I don't need you anymore. My blood pressure is, and I would quote, like 120 over 80 and my blood pressure is, and I don't need you anymore. Then what happened? One day, it was down. I called the doctor, a little alarmed, because I, I was taking my medication. I said, my blood pressure is only so-and-so. And he said, well, cut the pill in half. And I said, okay, so I cut it in half. Well, uh, in a few days, he was still not improved any. And so I called the doctor again. The doctor said, well, eliminate it. So I eliminated the pill. That's been many years ago, and my blood pressure remains in the normal range all the time. That was just one of the many things, but if you won't talk to the system, if you won't talk to the problem, you'll never be free of it. But you've got to talk to it, not talk to God about it, and not cry out to Him for your deliverance, but you speak to what's bothering you, and you take your authority over it, and you tell it, and quote the Word to it. Say, God sent His Word and healed me, and you're in violation of the Word of God, and I rebuke you. And I tell you, body, you cast off these unfruitful works, and quit allowing this body to come under the power of the curse. And God will show you, well, you've got to quit doing this. Stop doing that. The devil is getting into your life through these misdeeds. Stop the misdeeds. Stop the misdeeds. Uh, it's imperative. You understand it. I understand. God has delivered us. And the re redemption is ours. But we have to access it. Glory to God. Now, there's a, a thing that I'd like to just share with you, too. Uh, there was a time that I was diagnosed with a melanoma cancer. They're very deadly. And so... Uh, I went to the doctor, and he said, well, we're making you an appointment to go get the thing operated on. So I uh, had it operated on, and the oncologist told me, he said, now I'm going to make you an appointment down at MD Anderson so that you can get a follow-up. And I said, no, this is as far as I'm going with it. And, of course, he was alarmed. Well, this, this is dangerous. And I said, I know, but this is as far as I'm going with it. 
And he did say when we got there for the operation that day, he said, that thing doesn't look nearly as angry as it did before. Well, we had it removed, and I just told the Lord, Lord, this is as far as I'm going. I mean, I was like 72 years old then, and uh, soon I'll be 82. It's been going ever since. Glory to God. So I want to tell you, if you'll speak to your problem instead of speaking to God about your problem, then you'll find yourself in complete total remission. And it won't be because God did it. It's because God has already done it. All you need to do is agree with him. Go pick up the word that is, is a, appropriate to your problem. And when you pick it up, get that word. Just put it in your mouth. Put it in your heart. Visualize. See it. The Lord said, keep my word ever before, ever before your eyes, in the midst of your heart. And you know, if you'll do that, unless God is a bold-faced liar, it'll work. Well, he's not a liar. He tells you the truth. He said, the spirit that dwells in you will quicken your mortal body. Well, quicken means to make alive. So if your body is under curse of sickness, it's under the curse of death. Because sickness and disease is incipient death. It is death trying to set up. So you're going to have to do something about it. And only you can do it. God can't help you unless you help yourself. He can't save you without your cooperation. He can't heal you without your mouth and your, and your, your faith. And you say, well, I've heard people got healed before and didn't even know anything about the Word of God. They are not born again, usually. And besides, they don't know anything about the Word of God. You're supposed to be in church. You're supposed to be taught the Word of God. You're supposed to be taught about the armor of God. I found in Ephesians chapter 6. You need to learn to war because you're in a war. You're in a war for your flesh. You're in a war for your family. You're in a war for your finances. You're in a war about everything. And with this coronavirus going you know, rampant through the world and it's killing people by the hundreds, it does not need to come nigh you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. For the Lord himself shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways and bear you up in their hands lest they dash their foot against the stone. Because he set his love upon me. God saying this to the born again child of God. Because you set your love upon me, therefore will I be with you in trouble and I will deliver you. And with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. The word salvation in the Greek is soteria, which means being made whole, being made whole, spirit, soul, and body. And so I'm going to encourage you today, take the Word of God. It is medicine to your flesh, and take your medicine. And if the doctor said you take these pills three times a day, why don't you take your medication three times a day? Sit down with your Word of God. Read it to yourself. Make your declaration. Say, all right, I believe this, Lord. My eyes are on you. My life's in your hands. I believe your Word is quickening my mortal body with life. And I thank you. And in Jesus' name, I receive your provision for it is so all-encompassing and the love of God is shed abroad in my heart, Father. And I thank you, Lord God, for doing that. Now take my body and take my mind and use it to your glory. For that's the reason I'm on this planet is for you to use me instead of me trying to use you. And so, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Show me how to walk. Show me how to live. Show me how to do warfare in the Spirit. Show me how to rescue others. Show me how to teach the Word. Show me how to pray the prayer of faith. Show me, Lord. Teach me. The Holy Spirit has come here for that very purpose. Jesus said he'll take the things of mine and he'll teach them to you. Then Jesus said in St. John 14, 12, he said, the works that I do, shall you do also. And greater works than these because I go to my Father. Remember, what did Jesus do? Cleanse the leper, heal the sick, raise the dead, walked on water, commanded the storm to cease. He was in complete and total control and he never was broke. Not a moment. As a matter of fact, there's some kings came from the east to make sure he was financed his whole young life. He had 12 men working for him, paying their salary and for their family, and not only that, giving to the poor. He had a treasurer, 
If you got no treasury, well, you're not going to have a treasurer. Judas, even the one who stole from the bag, was still, was still a treasurer. Jesus was never poor till the day he was condemned to the cross, and Rome took everything he owned, two homes and everything else. Glory to God. Now, keep this in mind. Jesus didn't do these things lightly. And while you're hurtling through space here at 37,500 or 700 miles an hour, realize the Word of God is keeping it in check. The systems that are working in this world to keep you having oxygen to breathe and food to eat and water to drink and so forth and clothes on your back, those things are set in motion by God. And your life is important because God loves you. And you should learn to love Him and say, okay, Lord, uh, a sick body, I know you can't use it, so you heal me, and I will do what you tell me, and I'll be blessed in every area of life. And thank you, church. God bless you. Soon we'll be able to get, to get back together, have a prayer service, and we'll all enjoy the presence of God one more time. In the meantime, shalom to you, and peace to you, and healing to you, and the blessing of God abide upon you, and let his spirit run and keep your mind through all things and keep it in peace. Shalom. God bless the church. I miss you.